Support for The Common comes from the law firm of Davis Malm. Each divorce and family situation is unique. Their lawyers provide empathetic guidance and tenacious advocacy because your family matters to them. Learn more at davismalm.com. Funding for this podcast comes from MathWorks, creators of MATLAB and Simulink software, accelerating the pace of engineering and science. Learn more at mathworks.com. WBUR Podcasts, Boston. I'm Daryl C. Murphy, and you're listening to The Common. Offshore wind projects like Vineyard Wind are set to be a huge part of our state's energy future, which I know you all know from listening to The Common. But for such a huge infrastructure project, it's not that easy to get out and see for yourself. For one thing, you need to charter a boat to take you out to look at the Vineyard Wind Turbines located miles offshore, which is exactly what a group of New England reporters did in September, including WBUR's very own senior climate reporter, Miriam Wasser. Miriam, welcome back to The Common. Hi, Daryl. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure to talk to you. So before we hear more about your trip, right, remind us what is Vineyard Wind And basically, why should we care about it? Sure. So Vineyard Wind is the country's first large-scale offshore wind project. Mm -hmm. It's located about 15 miles off Martha's Vineyard. And when it's done, it will have 62 massive turbines, which collectively will produce enough power for about 400,000 homes. So that's a lot. Yeah. Now, why you should care. I'm going to start with why you should just care about offshore wind in general. Okay. So, and I really want to underscore this point. Like, we need this power here in New England. By mid-century, electricity demand is expected to double in the region. And we don't have a ton of space, right? Like, we're not going to build a bunch of solar farms that are going to meet that demand. We don't have a ton of space for onshore wind. We're not really going to build more nuclear power plants here in all Mm. likelihood. So unless we build a bunch of fossil fuel plants, which is there's not a lot of political appetite for anyways, yeah. like we can't keep the lights on. Right. What we have here in the Northeast is really good steady wind offshore. So like care about offshore wind because that's how we're going to keep the lights on in the future. And you should care about vineyard wind because it's kind of a bellwether. It's the first large scale project and all eyes have been on it since the very beginning. Offshore wind has been a long time coming in this country, and this is kind of, it's finally happening with Vineyard Wind. This is the moment. So you went out to see some of the turbines recently. Yes. So I went out with a couple other folks from WBUR, including climate correspondent Barb Moran, multi-platform editor Megan Kelly, and Franny Monahan, who produces this show. Never heard of her. Oh, yeah. She's great. (laughs) So we got up super early one morning, and we all drove out to Cape Cod together. And there we met up with a bunch of climate reporters from the New England News Collaborative, which is a network of public media uh, stations in the region. And we got on a mid-sized fishing boat and set out to our destination. Um, Life jackets are located under these blue cushions that everybody's sitting on right now. So fighting over them. They're all orange. They all look the same. So we'll get you all dressed up. It was a really gorgeous day. Literally perfect for a six-hour boat trip. In addition to the reporters and photographers, we also had a really stellar lineup of experts joining us. One of those experts was Michael Moore. He's a right whale biologist with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And he had gotten a very exciting tip that morning. A resident just east of Lucy Vincent Beach on the vineyard saying that he claims to have seen a very large pod of killer whales. I I have not seen the video, so Uh we never assume nothing until we see something. Oh my God, my dream in life is to see a killer whale. I'm telling you, free willy was why I'm an environmental reporter. (laughs) It's true. I owe my career to free willy. But anyway, the purpose of this trip was to give us all a chance to finally see the offshore wind turbines we've been reporting on for years. We got our first glimpse of the turbines about an hour into the trip. They looked like tiny stick figures emerging from the haze. They were a bit hard to see, and Barb suggested to our producer that she might get a better view from the bow. Yeah, see, it's pretty. 
You want to crawl out on that on that thing out on the front? <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> really funny, Barb. I'll hold your. I'll hold your. Oh yeah, I can see one. I think I can see him. It's hard without sunglasses on, but you can see him a little bit, just rising out of the horizon. I think I see eight. There's three to one side and four to the other. And oh wow, oh wow, oh they're lined up. Okay, okay, I get it now. I hope a piece doesn't fall on us. <laughs> that would be sucky, but at least there'd be a lot of people here to photograph it. I know. <laughs> Barb, of course, is referring to the incident earlier this summer when a bleed on one of the turbines broke. We can talk more about that later. So those rows Franny's talking about. The turbines are installed a mile apart, but out on the open water and from this distance, they looked a lot closer together. It was the first hint at just how enormous these things were going to be. As we got closer to the wind farm, I caught up with another expert on the boat, Amber Hewitt. She leads the National Wildlife Federation's offshore wind program. So Amber, what are you thinking about as we're approaching the turbines? I feel like we just drove to Europe. Like this is a really (laughs) inspiring moment for me to see this many offshore wind turbines in U.S. waters. Uh, It feels like a new chapter. Like it really is the start of this thing we've been working toward for so long. Offshore wind as an industry has had a rocky start here in the U.S. So we pulled up to the first turbine and suddenly the mood changed. The turbine just towered over above us, and it blocked out the sun. Everybody's just staring at it. I know, everyone went really quiet. It's amazing. We just passed under one, and it suddenly goes from looking delicate and dainty in the distance to giant and sturdy. Everybody has their iPhones out trying to take pictures of it, and none of the pictures. No no one's photos can do it justice. (laughs) We passed under several fully constructed turbines like this, and we passed by partially constructed ones. I've seen these parts on the shore in New Bedford, but seeing them out in the water just hits differently somehow. They're awe-inspiring in a way, just like a massive feat of human engineering. So, like, is this everything you ever dreamed of and more? (laughs) Yes, my biggest desire in all of life was to see an offshore wind project, farm, whatever you want to call it, (laughs) up close. No, this is really cool, though. This is really cool. I'm a little seasick at the moment, so I'm having a hard time um, expressing my excitement. I'm blown away by how, at the same time, these turbines look huge and really little, and how they look really delicate and fragile and also, like, super sturdy and massive, right? This is like steel in the water. I don't know, somehow it's, it's able to be both. After cruising among the turbines for a couple hours, it was finally time to turn around and head back to land. We were all still a little seasick, a little sunburned, but glad we went. Offshore wind is likely to be a critical part of the New England energy mix in the future. And as a reporter, it's just really helpful to have seen it in real life. We'll be right back. Support for this podcast comes from BU's Questrom School of Business, hosting a live taping of their Is Business Broken podcast, the episode... TikTok and the Future of Digital Marketing examines how TikTok is positioning itself to lead in an ever-evolving digital landscape. Tickets are available at wbur.org slash Questrom. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty, host of On Point. At a time when the world is more complex than ever, On Point's daily deep-dive conversation takes the time to make the world more intelligible. From the state of democracy to how artificial intelligence is transforming the way we live and work to the wonders of the natural world. One topic each day, one rich and nuanced exploration. That's On Point from WBUR. Be sure to follow us right here in your podcast feed. And we're back with WBUR senior climate and environment reporter, Miriam Wasson. How did you feel seeing this 
massive <laughs> wind turbine. Yeah. Well, I mean, I felt seasick, so I wanted <laughs> oh, to throw up. I'm so but, sorry uh, about that, by the way. That sucks. That was fine. But, um, it was cool. It was just, I mean, I think there's, it's hard to not be in awe of like giant infrastructure. You yeah. know, the same way you see a giant building sometimes and you're like, ah, that's yeah. so cool. And so, Miriam, while you were on the boat, the federal government actually made some news. They announced that on October 29th, um, next week, they're going to hold some sort of auction for wind development in the Gulf of Maine. Remind us where that is and how this auction will work. Yeah. So I think when we think about the Gulf of Maine, we usually think about the waters right off the coast of Maine. But mm-hmm. this body is this body of water is actually a lot larger than that and extends south all the way to the Outer Cape. And so what's happening is that the Interior Department is going to lease these areas. And it's pretty similar to how offshore oil and gas areas are leased, if you're familiar with that at all. But pretty much the federal government, which controls this part of the ocean, designates areas that it thinks are suitable for offshore wind development. This process takes many years and involves a lot of input from fishermen, local residents, states, et cetera, et cetera. And after they come up with the final lease areas, they'll put them up for auction. And so developers are going to compete for the rights to lease this patch of the ocean and then develop projects. How do you uh, build something that can hold a massive wind turbine on the water? Yeah. So what's going to be cool about the Gulf of Maine is that these are going to be floating turbines. So traditional offshore wind turbines like the one we just saw for Vineyard Wind are fixed to the bottom. And those work fine in relatively shallow water, but the future of wind is floating. Mm -hmm. And the reason you want to do floating is that they can just go in deeper waters like the Gulf of Maine and just like basically unlock a ton of power that traditional fixed turbine, uh, fixed bottom turbines can't work in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to come back to Vineyard Wind. Yep. They had the incident earlier this summer where one of the blades on a turbine broke, sending fiberglass and foam into the ocean. Um, What's the latest with all of that? Yes. So the project is still offline, meaning it's not producing power. So when we were out there, the turbines were not spinning. Um, Vineyard Wind has successfully cut off the part of the blade that was still hanging loose. And they're working on a plan to remove the rest of it and to clean up some of the debris that settled on the bottom of the ocean. At the same time, GE Vernova, which is the company that made the blade and is the contractor that's installing them, is still formally investigating what's happened. Though a preliminary analysis, right, concluded that it was a manufacturing error. Mm -hmm. And GE is working closely to inspect all of the blades that came from this factory and as well as the blades that have already been installed. In the meantime, Vineyard Wind got the green light to continue non-blade related construction. So they're still building the towers and the nacelles, putting them up together. Um, What's a a nacelle? The nacelle is the the top portion that the blades connect into. It's like the, it's the generator. It's like the brain of the whole operation. It's like a little box. Okay. So pretty much right now, everyone is just waiting to hear from the federal government about when the project can go back online. And we don't really have a good time estimate for that. Yeah. And how often does something like that happen where a blade falls off of a wind turbine? Not super often, although in the last couple of months, it's happened two other times. It, uh, That's three times it happened. Three times. They've all been GE blades. Um, the two other instances were in off the coast of the UK. And according to GE, they're not related. So now before we go, we're less than two weeks away from the November 5th presidential election. We recently had Barbara Moran on to talk about the candidate's climate goals more broadly. But I'm wondering, like, What you're hearing from folks in the offshore wind industry right now, um, what are you hearing from them about how they're preparing for either administration? Yeah, so I think that people in the offshore wind industry will tell you that the stakes are really high with this election, um, as is the case in so many other industries and sectors Mm -hmm. of life. But, you know, we really have two candidates with vastly different opinions about offshore wind. Kamala Harris While she doesn't have like a specific offshore wind platform, she is widely expected to continue the Biden administration's policies, which have been very, very pro offshore wind. So, you know, they want thousands of turbines up and down the East Coast, off the coast of other parts of the country, too. Harris, strong proponent of wind. Trump, on the other hand, has been a vocal critic of offshore wind for a number of years We have some tape of him at a rally earlier this summer in New Jersey talking about offshore wind. 
We are going to make sure that that ends on day one. I'm going to write it out in an executive order. It's going to end on day one. So people I talk to say it is very unlikely that if Trump is elected, he could actually just shut down offshore wind. What is more likely and what would be easier for him to do is to make things really challenging for projects that are still under review, that are still in the permitting process. So during his first administration, he slowed down the permitting process for Vineyard Wind, actually. So creating delays, you know, he could understaff agencies that are involved with reviewing things. He could just require that there be endless reports about how things get done. And that delay is meaningful. You know, another thing that people are worried about that I've had some developers tell me that they're worried about is just the the uncertainty that his rhetoric around offshore wind creates could make banks fearful about lending money to developers. Mm. And these are projects that cost billions and billions of dollars. So, like, they need to borrow a lot of money to make it happen. So there's just a lot of uncertainty. At the same time, the consensus seems to be that a Trump administration would not kill the offshore wind industry in the United States. There's a lot of momentum. As we mentioned earlier, a lot of states really need this power. So people sort of feel like a second Trump administration could slow things down, but probably not stop it. And so I think, you know, if I had to summarize how people are feeling, I'd say there's a lot of anxiety but not doom. Understood. Well, of course, be waiting and we will see. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for sharing this story with us and taking the time to talk to us about it. It's always a pleasure, Daryl. That's WBUR senior climate and environment reporter Miriam Wasser. And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening to The Common. If you like what you're hearing, please go to wherever you listen to podcasts, rate and review us. Let us know how you're liking the show. And if you want to get in touch with us, hit us up on Instagram at WBURTheCommon or send us an email at thecommon at WBUR.org. And now it is that time for me to let you know that The Common is produced by Franny Monahan. It's mixed by Emily Jankowski and Paul Veitkus, and it's edited by Samantha Joshi and Ben Brock Johnson. And our theme music is Me by Hisu. And from the newsroom of WBUR, I'm your host, Daryl C. Murphy. I'll talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>